that we are live. Hello, peace lovers and peacemakers. This is Sarah Jamshidi. You are on Peace Mindedly podcast. It's a podcast where I try to find people who are making peaceful um, connections and peaceful, uh, what, what they call them is they are peaceful bridge makers. And then these people are connectors of souls, ideas, thoughts, and they just bring people together. Uh, if you are right now, there's a chance that you are watching to this program on, on Facebook and on YouTube. So welcome, really welcome to the program, to the show. And, and if you are live on Facebook and on, uh, on these two channels, on the, uh, Peace Talk with Sarah and also on Gold to News, you are more than welcome to, uh, submit your comments and your questions uh, for my guest here on this program. I have my assistant producer, Matin Rokhsefat. Salam, Matin Jan. Salam, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, thank you. So Martin is here with me to uh, organize and to sort the comments and help me out throughout this uh, this programming. And we are here to um, take your comments and questions to my dear guest today. And and um, yes, I think I just mentioned everything. And today, right, right like every, any other programs, I mean, I I truly admire and respect all the guests that I have for Peace Mindedly, and very very specifically today's guest. It's such a special person to me, and I'm sure that we are going to have an amazing discussion with Zainab Salvi. Zainab is co-founder of Women for Women International. She founded the organization to help women survivors of wars. The organization has helped half a million women in eight conflict areas, distributed more than 100 million microcredits and loans, and impacted more than 1.7 million family members. People magazine named Zainab Salbi as one of the 25 women changing the world. The foreign policy magazine announced her as one of the 100 leader, uh, leading global thinkers, 100 leading global thinkers. And Fast uh, Company magazine called her as one of the 100 most creative people in the business. Zainab is the author of national bestseller, Between Two Worlds, Escape from Tyranny, Growing Up in the Shadow of Saddam. She has hosted several shows, including Me Too, Now What, original series for PBS, Through Her Eyes with uh, Zainab Salbi for Yahoo News, and Zainab Salbi Project, original series on Huffington Post. So I'm expecting to have an amazing discussion with Zainab. Please join us now. I'm welcoming amazing Zainab Salvi. Hello, Zainab. Hello, Sarah. How are you? I am fantastic and even better when I see you and have a discussion with you. But you know what? Not uh, probably within a few few many years ago that um, that this discussion could never have happened because you are from Iraq, I'm from Iran, and many, many years ago, our countries were at war. You know, I was reading about you and preparing myself for this show and for this program. And then as I was reading your stories uh, in, in many different places, I was thinking, oh, my God. So the, the thing that she experienced here is exactly what I experienced back in Tehran. The thing that she experienced there is exactly my feelings and blah, blah, and just go on and on and on. And I was thinking, I really wanted to see how was it like for you back then um, as, a, as a child, probably, growing up in Baghdad and, and experiencing the Iranian missiles in your hometown. Well, Sarah, I was a child, you know, and... Um, what I remember is few things. I mean, I think one story that will tell everything is my mother and I were in the car. 
um, uh, doing grocery shopping. And as we were getting out of the street, uh, an Iranian military plane was flying so low that we could see the pilot. I actually remember. And so my mother and I froze, right? Like, oh my God, there's a military plane in Baghdad here. So my mother just said, hello. <laughs> She's just like, hello, hi. And I remember him. I mean, we just like, and then he obviously did nothing. And uh, I mean, didn't kill us, you know, and then here I am. The, the reason I'm telling the story is, um, is as a child, you grow up saying, you know, hearing Iran is the enemy and you, all of these things, but you also know, at least in my family, um, that half of my family were deported or many of them were deported to Iran. Um, you, you know, that there is death, you know, there is killing, you know, that the story is, you're almost like repeating government propaganda, but not necessarily buying into it. But you know you have to do it because that's how what they tell you, all the songs or that, all of that. But that is neither here or there. I think the most important thing that war taught me and it impacted my entire life, regardless of who the war was with, was as a child, I realized that everyone in the news is talking about war from men's perspective. Men fighting, men talking politics, men having army, men flying, men be destroying. And as a child and then later a teenager, that war lasted for eight years. I'm like seeing the women who are the one who are running the show in keeping life going. It was the teachers were women, the doctors were women, the factory workers were women. My mother was a woman, obviously. Everyone in my life to keep life going was a woman. So here's what I learned. And I still believe that actually this is the foundation where I built Women for Women International is that there are two sides of wars. There is the frontline discussion and that is indeed men lead us, is the uh, lead it, is the army and the military and the politics. But there is the backline discussion and that is as important, as important, if not more important, as the frontline discussion. And that is led by women. It is about how do you keep life going? How do you keep school going, hospitals going, factories, economies going? And we are underestimated for our contribution to not only keeping life going, but to defining and building peace. So I really believe that there is no way we can have sustainable, lasting, thought through peace if women are not part of the negotiating table because women don't define the end of war as the end of fighting. They define the end of war as the building of peace, as the beginning of peace. And so that impacted me. But I mean, it impacted me as in, you know, walking into my home one day, I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a missile. Um, it impacted me in so many ways that night. I thank God and I still feel guilty about it. I thank God that the missile did not land on my family and it landed on someone else. Except the next morning, I realized it landed on my brother's family, a friend's mm -hmm. family. So war is complex. It, it, uh, it shows you... Um, it, I think it strips you, it takes you away to a core part of your hu human being where you're like, you want to survive. Um, it shows you the destruction of it. I don't think the, uh, anybody could have a good memory of war. It's uh, There's only fear and, and destruction and death. And over time, I end up working in war and I really see it as a manipulation of few happens to be men but I only see it as greed. We are, um, greed brings evil in my opinion and war is evil and not necessary. And that war killed so many people unnecessarily so. We didn't need to have it. Uh, yeah, but here's what I'm thinking. A greed that uh, is unescapable and some maybe there, it is something that we can learn from. Bear with me for a second. So what I'm thinking is probably after a big conflict and uh, any big wars or any of those, what happens is if we become survivor, we become 
sort of going back to what really means to us, going back to a, our own deeper understanding of life and what is life means to us, and then try to um, try, try to compensate for the, this, the guilt of survivors, try to help other people. And I just want to draw a connection between your experience and what's going to happening in coronavirus and ask you a question. See? That is what I see right now is coronavirus is something like a big conflict that has happened. Many lives has taken away. And then we got basically shut down of life. And it was a big, big conflict. And what comes after the conflict is unfortunately sort of we now know that it's a part of life that we need to live on for a few more months until we get the cure. But what has happened is we, as a survivors, we just now understand that there are so many more important issues in life that we have to pay attention to. And one of those is racism. One of those is these black people are getting killed. And now that we see activists and we see people who are taking action and taking charge, and I want to draw the same connection between this is happening and your life, that then you became survivor. And then you, you thought, okay, so, Life is very deep and extremely meaningful, and I saved my life, so how can I save other people's lives so then they can enjoy life? And uh, the reason so then you went to many countries and started helping other women. Is this a right, right, right draw of uh, parallel? It's interesting. I mean, because we obviously each what we do is a reflection of ourselves. So I, you know, I didn't save my life. I think, first of all, I think my mother saved my life. You know, my family was close to Saddam Hussein and she got me out of Iraq um, when I was um, 20 about to turn, I mean, 19 about to turn 20. And she, in an arranged marriage, which was a horrible arrangement and end up abusing me that marriage. But that's how I came. That's how I survived basically Iraq and Saddam. Um, and then I came to America and I list, heard other wars of other injustices that women were facing. And in Iraq, you know, you don't have freedom of expression. So you can't speak because you're afraid to speak about injustice. You see the injustice, you see it, it's in front of you. Um, but you don't say anything because in Saddam's time, because you're afraid for your life or your family's life, right? In what I learned about, uh, well, then I came to America and you do have freedom of expression. You do. I mean, America has a lot of issues, has racism, of course, has all of these things. But one thing it does have is freedom of expression. So I felt I have an obligation to take advantage of that freedom of expression and then express myself when I see injustice. But that expression was, it took me a long time, what you call survivor, was also about me. In other words, I believe when we see injustice and we look the other side and we willingly avoid addressing it, then we legitimize that injustice and allow for the corruption of our own values. So I'm saying, yes, you have to speak about injustice, but not because you're a good person. You have to do it because you have to live in consistency and in alignment with your own values. Like a lot of us, want to feel that we are so good we are not racist we don't discriminate against the poor but we do you know but a lot of people do discriminate you know so but no one say oh i discriminate right because everyone thinks of themselves as good person so for me it's like well to be really good it's easy for us to speak it it's much harder much harder to do it much harder to do it so helping others for me is honestly um, 
I don't do it. So that's one part of it is I'm doing it or I do it because I need to be consistent with my values. I am not doing it so I can get anybody to thank me. I am not doing it so I can get anybody to give me awards. And I am not doing it to feel good about myself at all. A lot of people say, I help this person. Thus, I felt I'm good, uh, so good about. I was like, no, for me, it doesn't give me, oh, I help this person. It gives me satisfaction. I am doing it because it is the only way to be in alignment, you know, so it's not filling a gap. That's one point. But I want to go back to about the survivor uh, guilt. Because survivors, we make it, right? You know, I've been raped. I have been, um, you know, my country is in war. I lost everything. My family lost everything, everything, everything. I have, you know, small items that is left from my um, family home. I, you know, I almost died myself a few times. And when you survive, I don't think, it strips you away. It strips you away about all these artificial things about life, you know, sure things. God, and it, 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 none of it is meaningful. What is meaningful for me is connections to my heart, you know, connections for me personally to God, um, and connections to Earth. Woo, is so important, and connections to community. So survival guilt, what they call it, is not only about you know what is most important, you know, in life when everything is stripped away. You also try to make, try to bring back meaning to yourself. You know, you couldn't do act on that injustice, so you must do something to help others. To it's it's your own healing. For me, I built an organization, as you said, reached out to half a million women. Um, I would tell them they have to break their silence. They have to be independent. But it was also speaking to myself. It wasn't only altruistic, what I'm saying. It was the two, me and them, were so connected. And I think it's important to be in awareness, in awareness about our connections between the person who helps and the person who is being helped, the savior and the survivor, the victim and the helper, the... We are interconnected. No one is doing anybody a favor. I am not doing anybody a favor by helping others. It is about me. Those who are demonstrating against racism, who, who if you are white and privileged, you're not doing any favor to anybody. It is about you. It is about your consistency with your values. So and your own healings, probably the healing path you take play you right. you create to um to to get over some of those pains. You mentioned two things. You mentioned connection to earth and connection to community. And I also know that you have a great connection with Rumi, right? Indeed. So tell me, tell me about those connections. I want to first, I mean, I, 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 I've read Rumi, I know Rumi, many of Rumi's by heart, so I'm on your camp about so much in love with this man. But tell me about your connection with Rumi. I mean, I want to tear up. For me, Rumi, my heart, God, they are all, it's the same story, really. Um, and it is a connection about uh, reminding us constantly about what is important, constantly. And so let me explain more. Um, because Rumi takes us to our heart. But you can go to your heart through meditation. You can go to your heart through prayers. You can go to your heart by walking in nature. It is whatever takes you into your heart. And so Rumi for me, the poetry is a bridge, is a tool that I used to help me go to my heart. But it's not the only tool. It is, it is one of the tools. The other tool is I have to be in, even if I touch a tree, even if I just see a tree, then I calm down, my heart calm down. And I have personally, I meditate and I pray every day. And it's because taking the moment to connect to your heart. And when you are connecting to that heart and this mind is stopping from talking and thinking, even if it's good thought, there is a language the heart has 
And all of us have that language. All what we need to do is stop this mind for a while, listen to the heart, and 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 understand its language. And the magic of Rumi is he was able to articulate the heart's language um, for all of us to hear. And I think all of us can have that listening ability to the heart's language. What, if what we is only take the time? To what do that. your heart tells you when you read Rumi? Um, it brings me back to what is most essential about life. I mean, obviously, every day I wake up and I drink my coffee and I just like uh, randomly open uh, a book. Oh, I just open a book on. Uh, Read it, story. read it, read it, Zainab. Well, yeah. it's a long poem. I'm actually very familiar with this. This is about Ayaz and the king's peril. And it's about a king who has a peril and brings all his wise men and tell them, break the peril. And they refuse to break it because it's such a worthy, materially worthy uh, peril. So they refuse uh, to break it. And he awards them. And he awards them. And he awards them uh, to thank them for it. But then came to Ayaz, one of the wise men, and he said, break the peril, and he refused to break the peril. I mean, and he broke it. They smashed it. And it's very expensive peril. And the, everyone like, oh, shocked. And Ayaz, the wise man said, my love for you and to listen to what you said is more important that peril and, than that peril. And wow. Wow, because so many times we get attached to all our material possessions and uh, and the peril is that material possession. And we um, let's of uh, uh, let's like that love to the king. He's saying is that's the that's the love, not the peril. The peril is material. It gets broken. It gets taken. It gets stolen. And so it is about the going to the essence of love. Just um, here, just here, um, Zainab, you mentioned something interesting. You mentioned a love between a man and a man right here. Uh -huh. And then so many years ago, you know, it was a gay love. Uh, two men loved each other. And if we could have, you know, tolerate that kind of love, and talk about that and write poems about that so why can't we do it now in 21st century, First century. that's that's very interesting well it's very interesting because you know as a muslim myself a lot of people in the middle east ask me about this discussion and it is obviously very controversial discussion particularly in the middle east and here's what i have to say this is my personal beliefs um, that all what God wants out of us is to live in our truth. Because when you live in your truth, right, you give the best out of you to this world, which is needed and necessary. And so for me, um, I prefer the bigger sin for me, from a Muslim perspective, because a lot of people say it's sinful, the sin is the lie. It's not whether you like same sex or different sex or opposite sex. The sin is if you lie about it, if you lie to yourself, if you lie to community, if you lie to God. So for me, being truth, it doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what the truth is. Be the truth. That's a better that's the real expression of love to god um and we switch god's concepts because a lot of people are uncomfortable we switch god's concept to make it something about fear and about uh, you cannot do that and you cannot do that and you cannot for me love god is love that's what god is so you are mentioning doesn't want you to lie exactly you are mentioning truth you are mentioning God and you are mentioning love all simultaneously. And then probably all of those are only one truth. Uh, I, rem I remind me, reminded me of Goethe, the German philosopher's 
saying that um, um, truth is like a huge big jar that has been dropped out of sky and has been in many, 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 many pieces. And each one of us has a piece, but it's just one truth. And that is God, probably. That's how, how I'm thinking. I, you know, I don't usually like to debate what God is or what truth is. My, the way I see it is as long as you are living by your truth, you are speaking your truth, you are being your truth, then it is your truth. But I cannot judge your truth. But that because I think the tension in the world, the anger, the resentment, the fear, the greed, the all the issues that we're having in the world is when we are not living in our truth. And when we're not living in our truth, because to live in your truth, you really have to be in alignment and you, you don't necessarily live the lifestyle society tells you that's what success and happiness is. So it doesn't matter. God also for me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm a Muslim, right? And I grew up with my mother telling me, don't think God is only in the sky. Think God is everywhere. Think God is in the flowers in the grass in the trees god is in the air and i have to tell you a secret because i really love god very 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 much and i sometimes feel god when i exhale and inhale is in the breath that's how precious god is it's so so i feel honestly i feel patriarchy has corrupted the meaning of god by making god a structure, rules and orders that by happenstance, men control, religious men control. And for me, God is everything and everyone, and it doesn't matter. There shouldn't be a dispute what God is because if, because love is bigger than all, you know? And so uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, that a lot of religious man really ruined ruined um the meaning of god um and took away its beauty and what we need to go back is to the beauty and the love of god not the fear and the worry of god absolutely absolutely when we come back i'm going to ask you why women are important in this discussion but stay with me zainab you are listening to Peace Mindedly, a podcast featuring peaceful bridge makers. We are live streaming our conversation on Facebook and uh, YouTube. If you're listening, you can find this conversation on YouTube, Facebook, and also on Goldtune, G-O-L-T-U-N-E. Uh, we post all the information and much more on goldtoon.com, a website I manage, I and Mateen manage with a group of international foreign correspondents to cover stories, uh, to cover lifestyle stories and peace journalism. Later today, I'm going to edit the audio file of this show and then post it on, hopefully to, by tomorrow before noon, post it on um, about six to seven uh, podcast platforms, including um, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Stitcher, iHeart, and many. So the edited um, version of this conversation is available on uh, many of those podcast platforms. We are taking questions and comments. Please uh, write for us if you have any question. Otherwise, uh, you and I and everyone in this program is enjoying the conversation very, very much. Peace Mindedly is a show that I manage uh, uh, every, I started um, every week, twice a week. And now uh, we have two more uh, programs to go uh, un until to um, complete the first season. Those two programs are going to be on June 23rd and June 30th, two, uh, two, uh, two Tuesdays. For uh, the next session, the next uh, episode, I'm interviewing three amazing women from Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, an organization who brings uh, Muslims and Jewish women together for better connection and better understanding between 
these two religions who have not been so friendly, with, uh, af especially after 9-11. And the um, foundation of the organization was actually after 9-11 because they really wanted to bring uh, these two communities and bring um, 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 build bridge of peace and compassion between these two communities. For this hour, I'm talking with Zainab Salbi, women activist, writer, community organizer, host for TV shows, and editor at large for women in the world in association with the New York Times. Zainab awarded many times for the humanitarian work she's done. Recently, she serves as a jury for the Hilton Humanitarian Prize, the biggest award for humanitarian work throughout the world. She also sits at the board of directors of uh, Synergos, Cine Cine I, I hope I'm spelling it right, Synergos and the International Refugee um, Ass Assistant Project, International Refugee Assistant Project, or IRPA. Especially important that we talk about refugee because June 20th is the World Refugee Day, and I want to ask um, um, Zainab about her connection with the organization, and uh, and probably if you could share with us some of those uh, one or two stories of those people who have been displaced from their hometown and their home country, and just share with us um, share with us in a way that we understand the kind of pain that they are going through. Well, first of all, no one chooses to leave their homes. That's what people don't know about refugees. You know, it's like you, because in your home, you're safe, you're stable, there's family visiting, and you're surrounded by neighbors, you know, and the familiar is so beautiful. So no one chooses to leave their home unless the circumstances are so bad that it's impossible to live in your home. And so that's, for me, number one. By the time you leave your home, most people, I mean, I've learned it, uh, you know, some of my families are refugees as well. They are like all what you leave, you leave behind stories and relationships, but you leave to, behind material things and you leave with only usually your paperwork, your documents, your uh, certificates of birth and all of these things. And so... That departure is like you are, um, it's a rupture. It's not, uh, this, especially in politics with this particular administration, they make refugees like a boogeyman. I was like, these are the most vulnerable people escaping the most harsh uh, circumstances and they are not choosing to do so. And, and then we demonize them on top of it. Now, what IROP does International Refugee Assistance Program. It's actually the only organization that very unique services that provide legal services for asylum seekers. So when someone is forced being out of their countries, a lot of my own um, people from Iraq or Syria or different parts of the, the world um, um, are refugees. And so all refugees, when they apply for asylum, they actually don't have legal representation. They do not have lawyers representing them. They do not know their rights, their laws. They just go to either the UN office or the whatever country's office and they apply, but they really have no um, representation. So they may not even know how to give you the right documents. And sometimes they, you know, they sign off their legal rights. So what they do is they provide legal services, lawyers to represent these asylum seekers to make sure that they actually have um, a process, just like any of us, when we go to court, we have a lawyer, they do the same thing. And as a result, they make sure that their family reunions, family are reuniting with each other, that there are a lot of cases that otherwise would slip, they represent them to make sure that they get accepted. So it's a privilege, honestly, and you talked about an organization you're going to, um, interview next time with the Jewish and Muslim women and Christian women. And it is an organization actually that also has all the diversity of all the, it's not religious at all. However, all the founder and the workers and the staff and the board are inclusive of all people. And when I see that, 
when I see people from different religions defending the rights of the people from the other religions that sometimes are seen as the enemy to enter and get asylum, it gives me hope. It gives me hope that the, the world is hard, I know. The world is also harsh and unfair, but the world is also equally beautiful and has equally good people in it. And we have to see that and focus on that as well. What is a woman's role of softening this harsh world? Mm -hmm. Very good question. I think we need to make this century the feminine century. What is at stake if we do not make it the feminine century is our own survivor as human species, in my opinion. And what do I mean by feminine? Because I don't mean by women by feminine. It's feminine values. You mentioned COVID-19 when we uh, opened the discussion. All the things, the highlights of things that came in that period was feminine values of kindness, of generosity, of love. People were asking politicians, some of them, not all of them, but politicians were talking about kindness. And I feel we need, for me, feminine values are not only kindness and nurturing and all of that. That is sort of limiting it. You know, it's defined by a man as feminine values means soft and pretty. That's not it. Feminine values could be fierce, could be strong, but it's kind. It's ultimately kind. And I believe we need to find it in ourselves because just because we're women, it doesn't mean we have these feminine values. I think these feminine values have been buried for centuries and we had to survive in a very masculine world, whether you are a woman or a man. I do believe we women today should not only speak about the injustice we are facing or other people's facing, which we do. We should not only help, which most, most humanitarian, as you know, are women. So historically and today you know we should not only help i think we need to define and show and demonstrate what are these new values and how can we come up with it and live by it and so it goes beyond the speaking up and beyond the helping it actually goes we need to do that you need to go into your heart and find these values in yourself and the complexities and the depth of these values and bring it to the world and bring it to the world by first living it, you know, not only speaking about it, by living it. And then we, we eventually we transform the world. But if we do not bring the feminine values in, which they are more uh, nurturing and more um, coexistence with earth and with each other, I honestly believe we cannot sustain the world um, in the same energy, masculine values built it. Now, I'm not criticizing men's values. It's helped us get to this point. It is good and it is also bad. But I'm saying we women need to rise up more than that. You know, we need to show now the path uh, that is not in reaction to others, but in pro actions to our beliefs and our values. And that needs some work. And men are part of that. It's not a women men thing. So what is your biggest strength and your biggest shortcoming in that regard? Oh, my biggest shortcoming. Listen, a few months ago, I almost died. It wasn't COVID-19. It was um, another viral infection. But I really almost died and I found myself in the hospital. Of um, Tell me more. Um, it was a... a it ended up being very severe case of Lyme disease. Um, but I found myself in the hospital struggling for my breath. And when the breath, when they gave me oxygen and I was like, oh, I could take breath for the first time. Um, the first word I thought of was kindness, kindness. And, and it was the kindness of the, the nurse who was an African-American man. It was the kindness of the doctor who was a Jewish Syrian American doctor. 
it was the kindness of a Jamaican nurse. I mean, it was that diversity, but it was kindness of humans. And so when I was stripped from my health, it wasn't even the safety of my home. It wasn't, it, um, it took me back, and this is my strength, to my heart in ways that I um, have not uh, connected to it before, right? So that's my strength is that I think I have um, love and, and reminding that there, there's a lot of love out there and we need to be in kindness to each other. I think we need more kindness in the world. I really do believe that. My weakness, especially as life is picking up, you know, and people, you can see the people, um, energy is back and not only demonstrations, but life, you know, coming back. And I see it in myself and I see myself slipping into the fastness of life and the impatience of life and the worry and the fear of life and losing perspective of what I learned when there was when life was about breathing and not breathing. And so it's impatience is the strength. So right now, and it's connected to Rumi, there is a difference in my day. I am someone who is committed to being in service to this world. This service is to speak for my truth. If I don't do it, I die. So it's like, again, not for you to acknowledge me, but I'm doing it because I need to breathe and that's my breath, right? And the day I start my day with meditating and connecting to my heart and connecting to earth is a very different, leads to a very different person than the day I started with immediately coffee and calls and work and da da da. It's a different individual. And the day I start with my heart is the day I am kind to everyone, even those who are irritating me that day. But I make sure to stay kind, to stay kind. And the day I am not connected to my heart is the day I lose patience, you know, and I become harsh. So it's a discipline. It's a discipline to be in truth to yourself. It is, it takes, I always did not like discipline as a teenager, you know, I, uh, ah, why discipline? But it takes discipline to stay connected to my to your heart and Rumi yesterday the poem that opened um, it was like it's a seed your soul is like a seed you have to water it every day so it blossoms if you don't water it if you don't connect to it it dies it dries out and dies and so it's a discipline to be living in your values it is a discipline to live in kindness and it's discipline to find what these feminine values are. Absolutely. So I think my husband is going to love this conversation. He keeps talking about discipline and he's a physician and she kills us with discipline, discipline, discipline. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, okay, so I have a criticism about this culture, American culture, and I'm going to compare it with our culture, the Middle Eastern culture. In this culture, at least uh, the way that I understood and have, uh, have understood is that we do our best to become in work in career and then and then in in such an american way and then in this route that we are moving forward everything is all about capital about material about getting big about doing this and doing that and doing that and then as you said so many times has happened to me many times i lose my connection against myself but i didn't have the same problem back in tehran i didn't and then i'm thinking um what are we what should we truly learn from middle eastern culture arab culture and the kind of kindness that that culture teach us that we do not learn in the united states of america's culture there there's so, so many great things happening here i mean i my daughter i mean i just i mean i'm amazed of the, the, the i mean reaching your potential going extra miles 
there are so many good things about this culture, but this aspect is just really missing. What can uh, the Middle Eastern and Arab culture teach us that we need to learn in the American culture? Well, I'll answer it in two ways. One, because unfortunately, I think even in the Middle East, sometimes you find our um, you find people losing our path um, and our connections. And I think the one thing that is the highlight from my experience in the Middle East is community. There is community. When I got sick a few months ago, I missed. I miss the idea of neighbors coming and visiting and relatives coming and visiting. And in here, you know, I have community, of course, thank God. Um, but it's different, you know, you call, you organize, you, it's different. So it's community and the value of family much more. You know, you put attention to family. And I think in here, often the career becomes the most important thing and then family becomes secondary because your the career demand and work demand is so much. So I think for me, this is sort of the the the, the um what I what I miss about the Middle East, right? And what I love and cherish about the Middle East. Having said that, I actually really think because you also see the Middle East losing itself, you know, in in, in that pattern. And I think the issue for me, it is our economic system because our economic system has made and defined success in a very limited way. It's about the accumulation, accumulation of wealth and of money and of property, whatever, accumulation. And the way we're doing about the accumulation, we're going about it, is it, uh, it is about zero sum approach. It means that we you suck everything. You suck everything from the person, if it's a talent, you suck everything from the earth if it's natural resources. You suck everything from your employees. You want to like suck everything out. And so, you know, yes, this, you know, we're succeeding economically well, at least used to, but you see anxiety and stress as number one diseases of the century of our time. Okay, I don't mean COVID-19, but emotional diseases that cause so much body diseases. And that is coming, that stress is coming for me from the economic system. Now we have to change that in order to uh, evolve. It's like, again, in order not only to make the 21st century, the feminist century, but to make the 21st century a livable century, frankly, we don't have as many jobs. We need to redefine what work means. We need to redefine what success means. We need to redefine what having contribution means if we don't redefine it, there are going to be a lot more uproar, a lot more revolutions, a lot more rage in the world. And that has to do with our economic system, which this country, America, has an extreme version of it, an extreme version of capitalism in a way that is actually creating what the disconnection. So I think we need to, it's time to balance again, because we have all went off uh, the spectrum, uh, the pendulum went to the other direction. And it's if we do not balance it, then we are in trouble as, as not only this country, I think as a humanity, as a collective economic system, in my opinion. Absolutely. You're right. I was just talking to my mom the other day and I said, oh, Iran has this, Iran is that, how beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And she she kept telling me that, sweetheart, Iran you see is not the same Iran as it's now. It's just so, so different. Exactly. So in our discussion, you talk, yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't know about Iran, but I see Iraq in the Middle East. People want, it became much more material. There is less consciousness about the environment, to be honest. There's a lot more ways of buy, 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 you know. So it is, it's almost like the, we're consuming junk. We're consuming uh, junk food, junk clothes, junk everything. And I think it's sort of the ripple effect of this capitalist, capitalist system in America. It's now we are, when, when, by the time it goes to the Middle East, it becomes even worse, basically. Yeah. So, you know. It's we can't romanticize, over romanticize any country and we cannot over demonize any country, in my opinion. But I do think 
the big elephant in the room is our economic system as a as a world and this country is the epicenter of it absolutely you go to dubai it's so much american you go to istanbul you go to different places exactly i i hear you so in our discussion you talked about feminine power you talked about kindness you talked about peace and you talked about god truth and most most of all of those you talked about love i want to know what love means to you that's a good question i don't i don't know but i have a lot of love i mean when you said love i had goosebumps and i teared up right what I are your love so i didn't dare to ask but what is your love it's there is no you know honestly it is not uh, you know a lot of people like is it one person is it one it's it's i just here's my philosophy in life and i have been hurt a lot in my life my heart has been broken many times by so many people by people i loved romantically by people i loved as colleagues by people i loved as family by so many people my heart was broken i you know and i still will not give up on love because i so for me love is not necessarily romantic it's that's one aspect of love um it is um what is love? I don't know. It is seeing the goodness in everybody, in my opinion. And because there is goodness in everyone. And you see the goodness, not because you want them, you are, you want to be stupid and not see the badness, but you want to see the goodness um, because it's also, a, if you see the good in you and the other person, you show them a path of connection, you know, a path of connection that they can have to themselves as well and to you. Um, to give you an example, what I mean, more tangible. As a Muslim, an immigrant from Iraq, a woman of color, a lot of times uh, people like, oh, yeah, Muslims are terrorists, Muslim are this, Muslim are that, right? And I used to be very offended, very offended. And then when I hear this offen uh, offensive remarks, I then, attack and when i attack i scare the heck out of them but uh, honestly it's not only about islam if someone attacks um a lot of muslims attack uh, homosexuality for example and believe it's oh those people are sinful people and my best bad. friends my best friends is a uh, are, are married to uh, two women married to each other and so i cannot accept attack and so be, before i would just attack them back and i become the scary person that's the and what i've learned what love does that's what i mean love is an attitude about life it is not a romantic person because when i was a teenager i thought love is a romantic uh, knight is gonna be on a white horse and he's gonna come and save me and i am 50 years old right now and i realize i am the knight and I am the horse as well. So there's no romantic fantasy. Love is only one person. But love is a way of life. So when I switched it to love, the same person who would say something very offensive about me as Muslim or about other people as gays, for example, before I used to react neg bark on them. Now I acknowledge the, uh, I acknowledge their fear. In other words, I see them as a human. I don't see them as the devil. And oftentimes we see the other as the devil when we don't agree with them. And when you see them as a human and that human has fear in her heart or in his heart and that fear, it is actually leading her to think that other people who look like me are scary and are violent and are oppressed and all of these things, right? When my strategy changed to love and love became oh, you're afraid. And this is what you think. And she would not, like you say, okay, yes. I wrote about it in my last book, Freedom is an Inside Job. You acknowledge the fear. And then when you acknowledge the person, their walls lower lowers down. And then you have to show vulnerability. And that is love too. The vulnerability of saying, you know, I'm afraid of you too. 
you know and i agree and disagree with my people i don't think all my people are good <laughs> there's some bad and there's some good so you acknowledge your own things that we often when we speak on tv we don't acknowledge a lot of muslims say islam is only peace well no there's violence there's violence in our religion as well so against we women women rights right? my god so for me yeah. that's vulnerability because you know you're not like it's all peace well it is supposedly to be all peace but now, now it's not all peace right so it's a vulnerability to show but then two hearts are now speaking with each other authentically and before you're racist you're sexist you're violence you're terrorist you're te and we don't but i was part of the issue before i was part of the divide and through love you create a bridge you create a bridge by seeing the humanity of the other in a beautiful way and that went for me in a way that you don't necessarily need to agree with them but at least see them and when you see the other their walls often lower down more often than not lowers down and a new bridge and a new communication starts that's love is seeing the humanity in everyone yeah you you're saying reminds me of uh, rumi's uh, rumi's poem says that your brother is your mirror what you mm. see in him is you so therefore try to see good things at the end of the program, I ask my guests to close the program by sharing something meaningful about peace, about kindness, about compassion, which you shared tremendously <laughs> in a large scale in this uh, in this interview, in this discussion. But I wanted to see if you have something to share with us, a thought, prayer, or something that uh, you would like uh, us to leave this conversation. You know, so I can only share with you what I am, um, what I can, I mean, I feel I died a few months ago and I came back to life. And I don't call it, I came back to life. I call it, I have arrived. And because in that uh, vulnerable, very physically vulnerable time, you arrive, you connect your heart. And when you're um, I had to ask myself, if I die, am I ready to die? Did I live my truth? Can I face God? Did I give it all? Did I try all uh, that I can? Are there things still missing that I have to do in my life? Are there apologies I still need to give? Are there forgiveness I need to do? And so I came out of it saying, there are three things that I every day must connect with to my heart in kindness to community in kindness and to nature and to god in kindness and and the question becomes live can i live my day today that if i die today i am dying in peace with myself because i've already cleared up all the pages in my life apologize forgave shared my love did kindness am i ready for that and that became my compass still is my compass i uh, did not used to i mean as a muslim i prayed and i did not pray and i prayed and uh, like i went through all these back and forth right now i wake up early in the morning every day to do that morning prayer is because and it is it is out of love this time it is out of love saying because when you are so stripped away and when you're about to die you only have you and god and that is the most important relationship and so how to maintain that relationship um and again god for me is not here maybe god is in my heart i don't know it doesn't matter but how do you keep that relationship every day so you try to live in integrity and in your values um, every day? And as someone who has been always led by my values and always led my dedication to help, even I did not have discrepancy 
between my values and between what I was living and how I was saying. So to live it in consistency takes a lot um, of awareness, awareness every day. Every day has to be an awareness. So now every breath I take, I say, thank you. And every exhale, I say, thank you. And I think that gratitude, that kindness, not only to ourselves, to each other is so, so needed these days. So needed. Very well said. Very well said. Zainab, I'm going to tell people how to find you. Stay with me. You are watching to Peace Mindedly, a podcast show I feature peaceful bridge makers. Zainab Salbi is one of those peaceful bridge makers. And as you can see and hear throughout the discussion, the whole conversation is about peace, about kindness and compassion for someone who has been in war zones and has helped many, many, many people. So kindness and compassion and peace comes very important to Zainab Salbi. If you're going to if you would like to find Zainab, go to ZainabSalbi.com. It's her website. And there are a wealth of information about Salbi, what she does and what she's up for. Also, Zainab is author of a few books. One of them, uh, an, uh, an Inside Job. I'm sorry. Uh, Freedom is an Inside Job. And then, and then the other book is Between Two Words, Escape from Tyranny, Growing Up in the Shadow of Saddam. Zainab is uh, the host of a few shows. I watched a few of them uh, when I was preparing for this program. Uh, they are, uh, one of them is a PBS original. Uh, it's called Me Too, Now What? The other one is Through Her Eyes with Zainab Salbi for Yahoo News. And then also Zainab Salbi Project, original stories for Huff uh, Huffington Post. And also Zainab hosted a very... Mm, watched and popular show for TLC uh, in Arabic language for the um, Arab um, uh, Arab national TV. And then that is also very interesting. I couldn't understand the language, but I enjoyed watching how Zainab manages the, the conversation. And I'm sure that she has lots of criticism for me. Probably I'm doing my best, but Zainab. <laughs> oh, it's a privilege. It's Thank a privilege, you so much. Uh, to be in this beautiful conversation. With a the same uh, here. The same here. Uh, Martin helped me tremendously on this conversation about um, so about uh, bringing the questions, the comments, sorting out, and help me with putting together the packet, putting together the program. Thank you so it was much, really Martin. Joy. And it thank was you, really thank, joy thank you, absolutely, <laughs> and for the talk. Thank you, Mati. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.